Thank you so much for that introduction. That was very great. And so uh, without any further delay, we're going to go ahead and get started here. I'll share my screen and fingers crossed our technology works for us, right? Alrighty, so as mentioned, um, today's webinar is uh, Uncovering an Invisible Injury. Um, I start today with uh, this photograph. Um, I think it's uh, a very appropriate to illustrate what we mean by an invisible injury. Um, throughout my career, I have worked with people who have often said to me, you know, people say that I look so great on the outside, um, I'm not, uh, not showing any physical deficits, but gosh, it's just stir chaos on the inside. And so we often will hear people um, say these things like, well, you don't seem very sick or, you know, I get overwhelmed too, and, and maybe you just need to be more positive or just, you know, have a little bit more practice. Um, these statements can get really frustrating, right? Because you, you are dealing with something that maybe isn't visible to everybody else, but it certainly is impacting your day, uh, your function um, on a regular basis. So today my goal with you is to kind of uncover some of these symptoms that we sometimes will see um, with people who are going through treatment for cancer and to give you some tools as well to maybe manage some of those symptoms. So to start us off, this term chemo brain is actually a misnomer. And I say that because uh, we will see people who have these deficits regardless of whether they've had chemo or not. It's a fairly new phenomenon uh, that's just been researched in the last, I would say, 10 or 15 years. But really a better term we should be using is cancer-related cognitive impairment or CRCI. It means the same thing but we really are talking about these thinking changes, the ones that are, that are related to your memory, your problem solving, your attention that you have to use every single day. And this cancer-related cognitive impairment is related to the cancer diagnosis as well as possibly the treatment itself. We can see these changes either preceding or following any treatment protocol. And we're really talking about non-central non nervous system cancers. So not necessarily those of the brain or the spinal cord, but cancers that are happening throughout the body because the brain and spinal cord have their own unique uh, characteristics related to the cancer itself. And as I mentioned, it is a misnomer because we will sometimes see this in people who um, are not even go undergoing chemotherapy. So we should maybe be using this different terminology. And I think it's coming as we do more and more research. Another term that you may hear is brain fog. This, again, synonymous with chemo brain and is a term that really describes those difficulties with thinking skills. The challenges that I think we have with these terms is that medical providers don't always believe that it's happening. I have heard this from uh, my patients time and time again. Again, because we're really focused on the cancer itself, we're looking at the outward um, physical symptoms as well as how it's affecting uh, on a cellular level, but we're not really looking at the cognitive piece as, as in depth. Um, medical providers also sometimes will say that they don't believe that chemo and the related treatment will cross that brain blood barrier. And so it must be something else. It must be depression. It must be because you're not sleeping well, you know, a whole litany of other things that it might be. For this reason, it is really important to rule out any underlying diagnoses that we might have. Certainly things like sleep disorders, endocrine uh, dysfunction, and some, even sometimes side effects of medications can all contribute to cognitive function. So it is important to be an advocate for yourself to ask for ruling out these underlying diagnoses that might be causing cognitive problems because we, we certainly wanna treat those as well. 
The other challenge that we have along with medical providers not always recognizing that this really is a, a, a can be a real disorder is that there's a lack of standard of care for both the diagnosis and the treatment of cognitive dysfunction. This has been something that as a speech therapist, I have fought with many times in my career to really justify that cognitive therapy works and that it really is necessary for people to return to function and return to independence. Within the cancer community, when we're looking at this chemo brain, brain fog, um, there's not a lot of agreement on how do we diagnose this? What tests do we do? Because the changes in function you may have don't always translate well to testing. Um, this may be in the form of a neuropsychological evaluation, which is a specialist that looks at brain function as well as um, emotional function and kind of looks at how is that supposed to work in the brain and how is that translating to you know, a task that you may have to do day to day. They still use standardized testing that gives scores and um, standard deviations and things like that. Your changes in function sometimes don't show up on those tests because it's not sensitive enough to pick something up like that. Likewise, if we're doing blood work, if we're doing imaging studies, you know, it may or may not show a difference in function. Uh, an example of that is, um, you know, when I work with people who have had a brain injury, particularly if they've had a, a mild concussion, that isn't necessarily going to show up on an imaging study on that MRI or that CT scan. However, what they are unable to do during their day certainly has been impacted. And so that's where we see sometimes it doesn't always match. We have seen in recent research, though, that as technology and science kind of come together and they're able to understand each other a little bit more, we have actually seen some studies of cancer survivors with imaging studies that do show pathophysiological changes. And that's really important and, and really amazing information to have because we never would have really known that brain matter or brain connectivity would have been able to be shown any other way before these advances in technology. So that's actually really good. Um, again, it hasn't translated to a standard of care yet, but I do think that that's coming because people are recognizing this as a much more important field that we need to study much more. The other um, aspect that I will mention of this is we really should be encouraging people for pre and post treatment care. When we are talking about pre treatment, this is looking at these cognitive skills, even before chemotherapy, radiation or any other type of therapy is administered. And the reason for that is um, similar to why we see people before they undergo um, say uh, a laryngectomy or a vocal cord surgery for a cancer. We always see these patients preoperatively for the purpose of education, understanding what's going to change with the anatomy, looking at some strategies that they need ahead of time, and really to kind of boost up their systems and get ready to undergo that very major change. The pre-therapy is really, and the pre-care is really important and sometimes overlooked. So it is something that we always encourage people to advocate for so that after or during the treatment, they already know what to expect. And there's already some groundwork laid for some, some uh, very strong strategies. All right, so let's do a little biology lesson. I promise it'll be small because this can get a little overwhelming, but I think it's important just to recognize again what's happening in the body. So the good news is you have billions of cells, and I do mean billions, in your brain, in your body. Um, you know, you have billions of cells there so that if we, if we lose some, if some die off, generally we're okay. Um, most of the time cells are not really dividing either unless there is a need to repair a cell, and that's usually in response to an injury. It also, though, is the response that happens with cancer. As cells divide, they, they become cancer cells. That's really what's happening on that biological level. So our goal in looking at treatment is we want to stop those cancer cells from dividing, right? And so the way to do that is to deploy um, radiation or chemotherapy. 
And at the cellular level, the first thing that happens is an inflammatory response. The cell becomes damaged due to that drug exposure. There's an active response to stress, like increased blood flow, a change in oxidation levels, and even releasing some white blood cells to try to combat whatever is happening. We do see that there are physiological changes even at this stage in brain matter because inflammatory responses are something that we can image and we can see. The next phase is either cell, de um, cell death and the beginning of rebirth of cells. Again, our goal is to stop this cell division. So at this point, we will see a decrease in the number of viable cells. Now that's cancer cells as well as healthy cells. So it is something that we do need to keep track of. Uh, diminishing myelination of the cells will happen at this point as well. And that's the highway, um, think of it as the super highway that transmits signals back and forth between the cells. We will see that decrease with these treatments so that the signal is a little bit slower. And that's why we get some changes in function because those cells can't talk to each other quite as well. The cells will inevitably shrink at this point and then be unable to dot, divide. Uh, possibly die off as well, which is the response that we're actually looking for. Our last stage to this is a rebuilding. There's a reconnection of neural pathways, which is what we want to happen as those cells regenerate, and the new cells are formed with an altered structure. So this is the, neuro, the neurotoxic response that happens when we are employing these, these treatments. And I say that because we will also see a neurotoxic response even when there's no treatment. And again, this is newer research that we didn't know was actually happening. It explains why people get this phenomenon of chemo brain even in the absence of doing chemo itself. So on the left-hand side of your screen, you see the response that happens in a cell when there is some cell damage. As I mentioned, they're programmed to repair themselves and one of the ways that that happens is using this protein gene called P53. That is deployed when there's injury to a, to a cell and one of two things happens. The cell cycle either stops, it repairs and it restarts itself, or it says, sorry, there's too much damage that's happened here and we need to just have this cell um, move on and, and to die off. On the right hand side of your screen is what happens when there is an alteration or a mutation of that P53 gene. It's not able to do its job as well as it needs to. And so when that normal cell becomes damaged, the cell cycle continues, that division keeps happening, and eventually it may end up being a cancer cell. Not always, but maybe. The genetic disposition is kind of in the middle there because that's a bit of the wild card. We don't always know um, who's gonna have what response to, to damage. We don't always know what cells will turn into cancer and why some people get it and some people don't. And we also don't always know who's going to have a particular response to the, to the treatment. Um, so that's why it's a bit of a wild card. It also makes it incredibly challenging to study because that means um, you know, we have to account for the fact that no two brains are alike, no two bodies are alike, no two cancer diagnoses are alike. So there is a bit of a variable there when we're doing this, um, this research. All right, so let's move on to the prevalence of these uh, cognitive impairments as it relates to the cancer population. It is likely very underreported. And I say that for the information that I gave you just a few minutes ago about the recognition of that being present both from the person themselves as well as their medical providers. So we probably don't have as accurate numbers as we would like to have. Um, because of the underreporting, and also just because it is very challenging to study homogeneous populations of cancer diagnoses. The most research that we have done um, in the field has been with breast cancer survivors, and that's because they represent um, uh, about 14 million survivors in the United States, so it's the largest population that we have, um, and it's been the population that has, uh, we've had the most research on. So in the 90s is when this research really got going and people started looking at, 
you know, the evaluation of these cognitive deficits, um, really looking at what's the best ways to, to treat it and to recognize it. And what they have found is that 40% of, of people reported these incidents even before they had any treatment at all. And that actually was very surprising to researchers because that really points to the fact that the cancer itself is actually causing some of these cognitive changes. 75% of people reported um, symptoms during treatment and 60%, still pretty high, reported after treatment completion. Overall, when we're looking at um, the incidence in, in cancer survivors in general, again, we turn to the breast cancer population who identified with CRCI about 22% of the time. Now the challenge, the million dollar question, is who's going to get this? Well, I wish I could give you a really confident answer in that, but again, we have wild cards with not really knowing who is going to get it and who isn't. We know that, um, sorry, we know that it may be um, dose dependent, meaning how much chemotherapy, how many rounds you're having to go through. It can be worse after a cycle of treatment as well. Um, we know that sometimes there are greater risk uh, with getting chemotherapy versus not, as well as if you have any other hormonal treatments that are going on or hormonal modulators. Um, sometimes those are administered in conjunction with chemotherapy, and that also can be a risk factor um, for potentially developing some of these cognitive impairments. But the bottom line is we definitely don't know who's going to get it, and so it's important that you're just aware of the possibility to be looking out for it. All right, so let's dive into the symptoms and, and give you some tools that you can uh, use to work with this. So this is not an all-inclusive list, of course. Um, there are many symptoms of cognitive impairment, but the ones that we see most reported in the literature are executive function, attention, memory, and language. So I'm gonna dive in a little deeper to each of these areas, kind of explain how they work in the brain, and then give you a tool that you can take away with you today to possibly um, help you manage it. So let's talk about executive function to start with. So when you hear the word executive, it might think of the boss or the one that is in control. And that is definitely the case with the brain as well. Executive function lives in this frontal part of your brain. Um, the diagram that you see here on the side is just one half of the brain. So you have all these structures on the other side as well. But for our discussion today, I'm just showing you one half of the brain. So this frontal lobe here at the top of your brain is responsible for things like you would expect an executive to do, right? To make decisions, to plan, to organize, um, be a good problem solver, and be able to use good judgment and control um, both of your emotions and your thoughts in a situation. So it really is the boss. It's the part of the brain that is figuring out what is it that I'm trying to do right now and how do I get going on that? When we see that someone will have executive function deficits, these are typically the areas that people have the most trouble with. As I'm going through some of these, it's think to yourself, are these things that sound like me? Are they issues that I've noticed that maybe I haven't been able to put my finger on or just not quite sure how to describe it to somebody else? This may give you some language and some ideas of how you could report this to your healthcare provider. So if you have a deficit um, in executive function, a person might have difficulty uh, setting correct goals and not setting too big a goals for a task that they're trying to accomplish. They might have difficulty initiating a task or even just getting going. They know that they're supposed to be doing something right now, but they've kind of lost that get up and go. Uh, a person might have difficulty judging time or managing how much time it will take to complete a task, how much time has gone by, and that could be problematic if you have a strict schedule that you're trying to keep. Um, a person might have difficulty organizing uh, their thoughts and their verbal explanations, as well as just their organization to complete a task to begin with, which is part of goal setting. Another big area we will see with executive function is self-awareness. 
um, being able to monitor uh, your impulses, your reactions, <clears throat> excuse me, to a situation, and then being able to reflect on that in order to change your behavior in the future. This self-regulation is, is a very challenging area with this part of the brain when it has been affected. And it can impact you in social situations, your work situations, a lot of different things, um, you know, could really be impacted by this. And then sometimes we will also see that people have a difficulty changing or switching from a task. They may get very stuck on the fact that, um, you know, their doctor's appointment was at two o'clock today, and then the office called this morning and said, oh, can, can you come a little bit earlier? That may throw off a whole person's day because this is what they plan for, and, you know, they're not really sure how to shift gears um, in that moment. Okay. So what do we do with all this? I don't wanna give you all these deficits and not give you a tool, so here's your tool. Um, there are lots of ways to address these issues, but this is one of the ones that I typically give when someone is having executive function issues. Um, I give them a five-step process called Goal, Plan, Do, Solve, and Assess. And it's a way to really structure your thinking to make sure that your boss is staying on track. So your goal is what is it that I need to be doing? How, what, do I, what am I trying to accomplish here? Your plan is all the details to do a task. How do I do this task? What supplies do I need? How much time do I have? What am I missing, right? The do is the get going. This is that initiation that says, okay, I know what I'm supposed to be doing. Let me just get going now. But also making sure that you're moving along the task and you're not getting stuck. Solve is where problem solving comes in. As you're going through the plan and you hit a roadblock, are you able to say what isn't working? Can you anticipate what problems you might have even as part of your plan if you think that's something that might come up? And then the assess is the last part. This is that self-regulation, that self-reflection. It's asking yourself the question, how did I do in this task? If I go back up to the goal that I set for myself, did I meet that goal? Um, am I, did I, did I do what I said I was gonna do? And what would I maybe change and do differently next time? So this goal plan, do solve and assess, is a tool that we use when we are working with executive function deficits. And it has application in pretty much anything that you're gonna do um, from deciding you know, where you're gonna move to in a new city to deciding what you're supposed to wear today, you know, depending on what the weather is. So very useful tool. All right, so let's move on to attention. Um, attention lives in two different parts of the brain, that frontal lobe that we just talked about, as well as the parietal lobe, which is kind of up here at the top of your head. When we're talking about attention, there's actually four different types that we reference. And any or all of these can be affected anytime we have cognitive impairment. Sustained attention is your ability to maintain your focus and keep your concentration on a continuous task. Selective attention is where you are choosing to focus on a task while you are having some type of distractor. That could be something that's an internal distractor like pain or fatigue or an external distractor like your dog barking or the television being on. Alternating attention is where we're shifting attention back and forth between tasks. And they are tasks that have different requirements from a mental standpoint and a physical standpoint. And then the last type of attention is divided attention. This is what we often refer to as multitasking. Um, and it's where you're simultaneously completing two tasks at the same time and with equal effort. In reality, many people will say, oh, I'm a good multitasker. I can do lots of things at the same time. But what we have found from actually observing people is they're really more alternating. They're shifting back and forth between those tasks as opposed to really truly dividing their attention. One of the best examples that I often give people when we're talking about divided attention is driving. Um, when you are driving, you have to be visually watching the road and seeing that curve come up ahead of you, as well as steer the car in the direction of that curve. If you don't do both of those things equally and simultaneously, 
of course, the outcome is not going to be very good. So that's an example of where you really truly are doing two things at once and both of them require your equal attention. When we see a deficit in this area, it's not quite the same as having ADD or ADHD, attention deficit disorder, because the reason that you're having these attention problems is different. So it's important to distinguish that this is not necessarily the attention that we're talking about in that traditional sense of that diagnosis. With the cognitive impairment that is from cancer or cancer treatment, we will see sometimes decreased ability to stay focused and to concentrate. We tend to think of endurance as being a physical thing, but it really is a cognitive thing as well. So if you are somebody who used to be able to read through an entire book, um, you know, in just a, a week's time, you may find that that's taking you twice as long as it used to because you're just not able to focus on that book for as long a period as you would like to. We may also see that people get very easily distracted, again, from those internal or those external influences, and it's much harder to stay on the task because of the distraction. Attention is also related to processing speed and how quickly you internalize information, decide what to do with it, and then react to it as well. So that ability to take in information is a little bit slower sometimes and can definitely um, make you lose track of what you're doing, lose track of information that you hear, or even just completing a task and trying to figure out, you know, what was it that I was doing here? Uh, and again, sometimes we'll see people are unable to multitask. It's very, very hard for them to do two things at the same time because that attention has been impaired. So what do we do about it? Um, I would say, again, speaking from an endurance standpoint, one of the most common tips that I give people is to know what your limits are and to watch out for signs that you need to take a break before you get to that breaking point. I often give people a work break work cycle to, to focus on, and this means having a very set amount of time that you work. It could be as little as 15 minutes to start with. You take a five minute break and then you go back to 15 minutes of work. Now, as you get better and as your endurance gets better, you can extend those work times, but it is important to take that break even if you don't think you need it. Now, a lot of times people will say to me, well, that's so annoying. I don't wanna keep starting and stopping a task. But remember the idea is that we're building up your endurance and building up your tolerance to the task. So even if you don't feel like you need it, you do need to stop before you um, get to that breaking point. Otherwise, you're really getting into that no man's land where your cognitive skills are just going to be fatigued and you're going to be a little bit unable to do work for a while after that. So it's better to stop before you get to that breaking point. I will often suggest people to think about their best times of day when they feel the most on. Um, that's really when you wanna do your most demanding task. And um, you know, if you are good in the morning, um, right after you've gotten up and you've had some breakfast, you've had some water, that maybe would be the time to work on things like your bills or an email back to um, a client. Um, but if it's later in the day and that's when you're feeling the most tired, that's probably not when you want to do um, your most demanding task. Sleep is a huge issue with attention. Um, regular sleep and getting enough of it can really uh, impact your cognitive skills. Sometimes making a cue card can help keep you on task. If you are easily distracted and you don't have the ability to limit those distractions as much as you would like, having a visual reminder of what it is that you're supposed to be doing could be very helpful. Just like we talked about with that executive function, if you're writing out your plan of what you're doing with a task and keeping that visually in front of you, that could help keep you on track. Oh, this is what I'm supposed to be doing right now. That's right, because I can see it right here on my card. And then another tool that I'll give people is to write down distracting thoughts as they're popping into your brain. I call this a brain dump. And it's something um, at SMC I often will give my students as a trick before they take a test because that's an inevitably when everything pops up in your brain except the things that you studied for on that exam. And so I'll tell them to do a brain dump 
get all that stuff out of your head right now, write it down on a piece of paper and then crumple it up, toss it over your shoulder because you're gonna deal with it later. It's not something you can deal with right now because you have really um, to focus that brain power on the task at hand. And then another tip for attention is when you are changing tasks, use some self-talk to remind you of what it is that you're about to do next. Talk through it with yourself, jot it down, you know, give some additional reminders as to what it is that you are working on. All right, next is memory. Uh, memory lives in the temporal lobe of your brain, which is right here on the side above your ears. And memory is actually a process. It's not a distinct thing like having blue eyes or having a new pair of shoes. It is actually a process of events that happen. And it's important to recognize that it is a process because that sometimes will help you figure out where you need to use a memory strategy. So memory itself is made up of kind of four key parts. It is first using attention to recognize that there is a stimulus in front of you and to process what that stimulus actually is. Is it something I'm smelling, I'm seeing, I'm feeling, I'm doing? And so the brain uses that information to figure out what is it. Then the brain has to decode what pieces of that information is important for me to remember. You know, as I say to my students, when you're sitting in a lecture, you're not gonna remember every single thing that that professor says. Your brain just isn't capable of doing that. So what are the key pieces of information that you need to jot down in your notes? Same as if you were sitting in a meeting um, with your colleagues. You're not gonna write down and remember every single thing that was said, but can you get the gist of the conversation? Do you know the key details? Once you have that smaller pieces of information, the brain then sorts or categorizes the information into groups that make sense, links it together in some way so that it can be stored appropriately, okay? And then the retrieval of information relies on these other three processes going well. Um, when you're trying to think about what is that thing I'm trying to remember, you're going to go and pull out from that category, from that sorting drawer, the information. If you tried to decode too much information, that process is going to be a lot harder. So retrieval or recall of information depends on how you process it in the first place, how you coded it, and then how you stored it. So when memory deficits creep up, um, the reasons that that happen, again, that slowed processing speed. Oftentimes we look at this with working memory, which is the ability to kind of hold information in a temporary way in your brain while you're manipulating it. If your processing speed is a bit slower, it's a lot harder to hang on to that information. Sometimes people will be unable to focus on important details to really be able to pull out that salient information that they need. They're trying to remember too much. And then retaining information in the moment from a short term memory perspective uh, uh, situation as well as perspective memory. And perspective memory is interesting and we've all had this happen to us. This is remembering to remember. Right. So if you've ever walked into a room and thought, what am I what am I doing here? What did I come in here for? That is perspective memory. It's remembering what you're supposed to remember. So I'm, I thought about that maybe in the kitchen. Um, oh, gosh, I need to go check my computer and, and see if I turned off that alarm. Right. Because I don't want that alarm to go off for a meeting. And then once you're done what you're doing in the kitchen, you walk to where your computer is and think, well, now, why did I come in here? What was the purpose? And so retaining that information in the moment is a deficit that we often will see. And then sometimes the deficits happen because those storage connections were poor. Maybe again, the information was sorted and stored in the wrong way. Um, you know, think about it like a filing cabinet. They just opened the drawer, threw the information in and slammed the door. Um, it, there's some thought process and organization that happens when we're trying to remember something. The effort that we put into trying to remember something is how we are better able to retrieve it um, in the end. All right, so what do we do about memory strategies and memory tools? We can use external strategies as well as internal strategies. 
external are things that happen outside of you, right? So we are talking about timers and alarms that might go off either to start a task or to stop a task or as a reminder that something's coming up. Calendars and day planners are visual cues that we can use to remember what to do during the day, that you have an appointment coming up, um, or even just that you're supposed to go to the grocery store. Other visual cues that are helpful are things like cue cards, labels, cheat sheets. Um, if you are learning a new process, like a new technology, I just got a new phone over the weekend, not because I wanted to, but because my old phone died, and trying to remember all the steps that I have to go through on this new phone. Um, if I was having a lot of trouble with that, I might make myself a little cue card or cheat sheet about how to do each of those steps. So it's something I could refer to later on. And then environmental cues can also be an external strategy. These are things like a pill box for your medications, sorting those out um, for the week so that it's a visual reminder. If you open up that pill box and you see the pill is still there, that means you didn't take it. If the pill is gone, that means you probably did take it, even if you don't remember if you did. Um, and, and even having a home base for things. So your keys, your glasses, your wallet, they all have a place that they live and they always stay there in that place. Internal strategies are things that happen inside of your brain. So you're using conscious effort and a conscious process to try to code, sort, and retain that information. Rehearsal and repetition is one of your best insurances policies. Saying things over and over again, writing things down over and over again, the more that your brain processes that information, the greater chance that it's going to stick. Sometimes people find using acronyms or chunking is helpful. These are ways to sort the information either by um, yeah, first letter cue or a category cue, something that sort of groups those things together and makes it easier to learn. And visual association, if that's the way your brain is wired, can also be really helpful. I'm a visual person, so I tend to think of this very often when I'm trying to remember something. So this is creating a picture in your head of the things you're trying to remember. The weirder the image, the more bizarre it is, the more likely your brain is going to remember it. And the reason for that is because it's much easier to pull up one image in your head as opposed to five or six different things that you need to buy at the grocery store. So the next time you have a list um, at the grocery store, write your list down but put it in your pocket and maybe try one of these strategies and see if it's something that you can challenge your brain to remember that list without looking at the physical piece of paper. Um, sometimes it's important to really practice these skills and figure out and try them on and figure out which one really fits you the best. All right, and uh, the last area that we'll talk about here is language. So language also lives in a couple different parts of the brain, that frontal lobe and that temporal lobe. And really language is um, something that is connected in many parts of the brain. So although we're identifying these two, um, there are really with all of these skills, we require, our brains require uh, the outer covering of our brains, the cerebral cortex, to share information back and forth so that the messages continue to go from one lobe of the brain to the next. But in general, we're talking about language as the ability to understand and to process language. Um, this is words, this is the, the way that someone is coming across to you, their tone, um, their, um, their body language. Um, so it's more than just the words that they're saying, it's also all the, all the nonverbal things that go with uh, communicating with someone. This also refers to organizing your thoughts correctly and finding the words that you want to say so that you can express yourself in the way that you want to. When we talk about language, we include reading and writing as well, because those are forms of input where reading is where you're understanding a visual language and writing is output where you are producing and understanding um, a, a, a written word. When we see deficits in language, uh, that is often referred to as aphasia. 
Um, it is a term that refers to a loss of language or an inability to access language. And so the deficits that we'll see here include misunderstanding or misinterpreting what has been said. Uh, the brain wasn't able to process either all of it fast enough or it processed it incorrectly, maybe left some holes there. And so what the message that went in is a little bit jumbled. It doesn't really sound quite right. This is really important because if you're not able to process what's coming in correctly, a lot of times we will see that mimicked in being able to say what you want to say correctly as well. Um, sometimes people will have difficulty retrieving a specific word that they want to say or they want to write. This is that tip of the tongue phenomena that we um, all have uh, every once in a while, but certainly we'll see this with cognitive impairment a little bit more. Um, it's a little bit harder to efficiently get that word out and so people will kind of stumble across the word or just kind of stop talking altogether. Um, as I said, thoughts can be disorganized or missing some of those details. And people may also have the decreased ability to interpret things like um, signs or numbers, making things like navigating around the community very challenging because they're looking at something that they think they should be able to interpret, but not really sure what that symbol means or what that number, um, is, that a, is that a six or is that a nine? I'm not really sure you know, what I'm looking at. So what can we do to help with language? Um, there are lots of things. And again, it really depends on the type of deficit. But for the things that we see most often, um, that tip of the tongue phenomenon, I'm trying to get that word and it's just not coming. Sometimes we will suggest that people use what we call circumlocution, which is describing what you're trying to say or talking all around that word that you're trying to say. So what kind of thing is it? What does it look like? Where do you use it? Um, anything that sort of fills in the blank to try to trigger that word. We may suggest that you use gestures or pointing to try to demonstrate to someone the word that you're trying to come up with. Uh, it may be helpful to draw a picture even, or to go through the alphabet, which is sometimes a very helpful tip when you're trying to remember somebody's name. If you can go through the alphabet and sometimes that letter will kind of key it in for you and, and pull out the right drawer, um, that may be a way to help remember somebody's name. For thought organization, uh, picturing it in your head and using that different part of the brain for visual imagery could be very helpful as you're trying to describe something because again, you're not relying on just picking out those words. You may be able to visualize a picture and match it up to the vocabulary that way. That can be a cue for pulling out those correct words. If you have the ability to rehearse what you're gonna say prior to a big meeting with a client or a tough conversation that you might have with your doctor or with a friend, and if you have the ability to rehearse it or even write it down beforehand, that can be very helpful for organizing your thoughts and preparing you for those conversations. And then in general with conversations, if you have the ability to keep distractions down, that's going to be very helpful for you. You can also ask for clarification or repeat back what you think you heard that person say. It's a really useful tip for keeping that conversation going without it being obvious that maybe you didn't quite understand it. Um, so that can be a really helpful tool. And then limiting your time in conversations. If you know that your endurance is not there, make sure that you tell somebody, I have a few minutes to talk to you, but then I'm going to need to go set up that stage ahead of time and maybe even limit your partners too. you know, those people that maybe push your buttons and kind of are a little more challenging to talk to than others. So again, knowing how you're feeling that day and who you feel like you can have a positive, productive conversation with and who you can't. All right, just checking to see if everybody's still there. We're almost to the end here. Um, we've talked about some things to keep uh, cognitive impairment um, in check, but I also wanna give you some tools for just general health overall, which we know has a really big influence when it comes to cognitive function. <clears throat> 
So you've all heard about the benefits of physical exercise. You know that that's a really, really key thing for you, um, cancer diagnosis or not. But particularly when we're talking about cancer treatment, um, this is probably the one area where we do know that there's been quite a bit of research and positive outcomes with. We know that physical exercise reduces inflammatory responses Thinking back to that biology lesson that I told you, that's one of the very first things that happens when we have cellular responses to treatment. So if we can reduce an inflammation, um, that's always gonna be a good thing and a target that we want as part of the treatment plan. Physical exercise we know also promotes sleep, which is really important in the field of brain injury. When you're sleeping, you're healing is what we tell people. So if you're sleeping a lot, that's okay because what's happening during that time is you're eliminating toxic waste, there's brain regeneration that's happening, brain reconnection that's happening. So sleeping means healing and that's a good thing. Physical exercise, uh, plenty of research out there that shows it improves emotional well-being, and that's because it increases those good neurotransmitters and it reduces things like cortisol, which is your stress hormone. And that's really, really important uh, because studies have shown that very high levels of cortisol for a prolonged period of time will actually contribute to brain atrophy. Um, which will also contribute to cognitive impairment. So the more stressed you are, the more cortisol you have, and the greater impact it's having on overall brain tissue. So if there's ever a reason to exercise, it's because you want to keep the brain that you have, right? That's a pretty good motivator. And we also know that physical exercise increases blood flow. So that certainly increases oxygenation and um, just blood flow in general, which is all really, really important for recovery and fighting that inflammatory response. Another thing that we are we really want to promote is something called cognitive fitness. Um, this is a really cool new term that has just been researched in the last couple of years and kind of really well defined. And I love it because it's really looking at that goal-directed action. Um, and it's made up of knowledge and skills and attitudes. So it's drawing a lot from the sports world. And um, when we look at sports psychology and we look at positive psychology, you know, when we're working with athletes, we look at their ability to know what it is that they're supposed to be doing, develop those skills like agility and endurance and, and strength, but then also look at their attitudes towards that game or towards that sports performance. Cognitive fitness is starting to follow that same umbrella, which is a really neat way to look at it. And so what we want to promote is what we call cognitive reserve. The more cognitive reserve that somebody has before they have an injury, before they go through any type of treatment or diagnosis, the better off they're going to be. And the reason for that is because it is a neuroprotective um, phenomena to have cognitive reserve. So stimulating your brain all the time, whether it's new learning, social interaction, um, you know, really challenging your brain, like I said, with those grocery lists to remember it without looking at that piece of paper, you're building neuroprotective layers on your brain and on those cells that are so critical to, to brain function. So this is important to look at pre-treatment, during treatment, and after. We want those neuroprotective mechanisms to be present even from the very beginning. So how do we do this? Well, there's two parts. A training programs are one of them. So this could be something like a computer program like Lumosity or Brain HQ. Um, these are two that I often will recommend um, to, my, to my own students, to my own patients, um, because they're science-backed and there is some research as far as their outcomes. There are lots and lots of those training programs out there, and I'm not saying any of those other ones are, are not good. But I think the key to remember is that these training programs are meant to be working on a specific skill in the moment. It is not realistic to expect that if you just do the programs on Lumosity, that my brain will get better everywhere else. Just like with an athlete, if we are training them to lift a certain amount of weights, that doesn't mean that they're going to automatically be able to run faster. 
right? We're using that skill building, that strength training in order for them to apply that to the race, to the event that they're training for. So this is the same thing. You're using these brain programs to train a particular skill, but then being able to transfer that into the real world and into functional environments. So another part of cognitive fitness is rehabilitative therapy. This is actually working with a professional like a physical therapist, an occupational therapist, a speech therapist like myself, or a neuropsychologist to incorporate that strategy building, really coach you on that process, and then also show you how to functionally implement that in your day-to-day -day activities. We're seeing some really good results also with neurofeedback. So these are things like EEG uh, machines that measure brain activity and have you exhibit some very specific active control over certain regions, as well as things like TMS, which is uh, passive electromagnetic pulses that are offered to the brain to modulate a specific brainwave patterns. This is all really newer um, research that's being done as it relates to cognitive impairment. Some of these things have been used pretty, um, pretty regularly in the mental health world, but we're only just starting to see the benefits of it from a cognitive perspective now. And then brain fuel. Um, of course, uh, we want to encourage healthy lifestyle choices, um, good nutrition where we're using brain builder foods and limiting some of those brain waster foods that don't have a whole lot of nutritional value, regulating your sleep patterns as much as you can, and then asking for help and support as well. Um, nobody expects to go through these journeys 100% alone. Um, you have a team of people that can help you um, identify more people to add to your team, whether it's this organization, uh, peers, uh, your, your doctors, your nurses, your therapist. Um, don't be afraid to ask for help and support because those are things that can fuel your brain as well. And then of course, medications and supplements under your doctor's advice may also be things that really can be beneficial uh, to keeping that brain in check. So I leave you today with this graph. Um, I think it is uh, very telling of what I have heard people say over time. Um, when we talk about healing and we talk about this, this journey from day one of getting your diagnosis, and um, we have this expectation of what we think is going to happen, right, with recovery and with healing. It's that blue line. Well, you're telling me that this happens and this happens, then this happens. But in reality, it's really the orange squiggly line, right? It's different for everybody. Um, it's really unpredictable at times. And I think what actually happens um, you know, makes it so much harder because we can't really always tell you and show you what's coming down the line. Um, it's important to recognize what works for you in the recovery process and what works for you in terms of managing cognitive impairment. But I think one of the best things that I heard someone say recently is to control what you can and adjust for the rest. And so with that, um, I thank you very much for spending time with me today. Um, that's my email address there. So if you want to jot that down, if I don't quite get to all the questions today, I think we have about 10 minutes left here. Um, feel free to reach out and email me. I'm happy to answer any questions you have that we don't get to today. So thank you very much. All right. So uh, I think we have a few questions here in the chat. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, see if I can answer those for you guys. So the first question here is, how does someone go about getting a neuropsychological evaluation? Um, for myself, cancer survivor, and my child 11 year old? Great question. Um, so a neuropsych evaluation um, is typically done as a referral process. Um, so it may be that you need to talk with um, your primary physician, um, your child's pediatrician, to get a referral for a um, neuropsychological evaluation. I would recommend checking with your insurance to see what types of services are covered, as well as the providers that are recovered, and that may help you in the referral process. Um, a neuropsych evaluation is very, very long. 
Um, it's usually about a seven or eight hour process. It can be spread out over a couple of days, particularly for a younger person, but it is a really intense process, um, but it gives a lot of valuable information as well. Uh, the, next the next question, which doctor can refer me to have those training tests? Um, so I'm not I'm not quite sure if this relates to the neuropsych test or if it relates to um, the training programs. Um, so Lumosity and HQ, the training programs that I mentioned, um, are something that you can uh, sign up for yourself online. Um, most of them have free trials to um, to practice out, uh, practice and sort of test out those uh, programs before you actually use them and then they usually have a small fee associated with them for a subscription. Um, so there, there's no referral that needs to happen with that. If you're referring to therapy itself, like PT, OT, or speech therapy, um, again, that process is usually going to come from your primary physician, um, a neurologist, um, an oncologist that you might be working with. They can refer you to those types of therapy programs. Uh, okay, and same issues for pediatric patients. Um, so I'm assuming you mean in terms of cognitive function. Um, so again, not a lot of research on this. Um, you know, definitely when we're talking about cognitive impairment with kids, it is a little bit different because kids are still growing and they're still developing, right? So sometimes they will have a little bit more resiliency to managing those things, but sometimes not. And the reason why is that cognitive reserve. So pediatric patients haven't really had the same opportunity to develop those experiences and develop that cognitive reserve. And so although we would sometimes expect them to do better, sometimes they actually have more problems because there's less reserve to hold on to or to access. Um, so it's very individualized with pediatrics. We have to really work with them very carefully from a developmental standpoint um, to see where they're at and be able to sort of adjust for that. Um, treatment and strategies are still gonna be very similar for the cognitive deficits themselves, but I think the bigger variable is the, um, is the outcomes and who might develop uh, those cognitive deficits. Thank you so much for being here today, Stephanie. It looks like, oh, I jumped the gun. It looks one more like question, one more yeah, question. I see that. Um, preventive measures. Yes, so I would say um, all the things that I mentioned um, as far as cognitive health, um, definitely um, working on building up that muscle, if you will, of your brain, just like you would build up muscles in your body. So that's keeping your brain active, um, challenging it to do new learning. So that's taking a class, learning how to play an instrument, learning a language, anything that you can do that really challenges that brain and keeps it active because your brain is like your body. If you don't use it, you lose it. And, and so think of, the, think of it as a muscle in that way, just like you would be exercising muscles in your body, you want to be exercising muscles in your brain every single day. And of course, maintaining healthy lifestyle, getting good sleep, you know, all those things that we know that go into health in general. Wonderful. That looks like that's all that we have for today. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today and to provide this wonderful information. Of you who are watching, this is being recorded, so it will be up on our website video library in a couple of weeks for you to refer back to. Um, we are so happy to have you today, Stephanie. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was nice to be here, and um, I look forward to uh, talking with you guys again soon.